Tim, thank you for agreeing to uh, speak to us on video for Bio News Services. Tim Boyd is Director of State Policy for the National Organization for Rare Disorders, based in Connecticut, and I understand you work out of Washington. Yep, thank you for okay. having me. My pleasure. Could you talk a little bit at first to uh, address the general issue of rare diseases and how state legislators at the state level uh, have an effect on the rare disease community? Yeah, of course. I, the basic dynamic at play is that a lot of healthcare decisions that affect rare disease patients and their families and caregivers are made at the state level. So one example of that would be something like newborn screening. So although there are a lot of federal laws that dictate funding for newborn screening that derive new federal recommendations, the actual implementation of newborn screening happens at the state level and it's actually state health departments that are responsible for determining which disorders are going to be on a newborn screening panel, what kind of follow-up services may be available to families, what kind of funding looks like on those programs, and the like. So, for example, in newborn screening, we recently did an article about spinal muscular atrophy, mm -hmm. and I was surprised to learn that only six states are actually screening at the present time, although another 12 are considering it or have passed the law. Yeah. Why, for a disease like spinal muscular atrophy, why aren't all states screening for this? So, I mean, you have to think about what it actually takes for a state to screen for a disorder at the population level. So when we're talking about newborn screening, you're not talking about just screening for a select number of patients that may present with a certain number of symptoms or something like that. You're talking about screening every single child born in the state. And there's a huge logistical burden that states have to kind of ramp up their capacity to do that. In addition, states want to make sure that their hospitals, their birthing centers can implement that screening in a proper way and to make sure that proper follow-up is there. And all that takes time, all that takes money. So actually, the fact that there are already six states screening for SMA, given that the recommendations from the federal government came out only a, a short time ago, is actually pretty good progress. And the, we're seeing in newborn screening generally that states are doing a much better job of responding to new federal recommendations, responding to new advances in science and research um, better than they have in the past. There's still a, lot way, a long way to go. There's still a lot states can do to improve their screening programs, but I think SMA is actually a success story um, rather than something that's considered a kind of a, a problem at this point. SMA is a success story, and what about diseases such as Duchenne? Is it possible to implement a, nas a national screening program for Duchenne? It, it really, when it comes down to determinations of whether you're going to have something done on a, as a national screening program, there's a lot that public health experts have to think about. Uh, first and foremost, they want to make sure that there's actually something that can be done once that disease is identified. So is the treatment up to the standard where it's acceptable to identify people and link them into care? Um, in addition, you actually have to have a very uh, a newborn screening test that is reliable and effective enough to make sure that it's not going to have a lot of false negatives or false positives. That's the same. I can't speak to Duchenne specifically, but that's the same for any kind of condition where the standards that states have, the standards that public health experts have for what is on a newborn screening program and what is not is quite high and it takes a long time to advance the research and advance the science to get to that point where disease could be on those programs. That is one of the things that NORD and other organizations are working to improve. We want to make sure that more money goes into newborn screening research to make sure that there are, that the benefit of screening, which is that early identification and early diagnosis can be uh, used by more diseases. But we have to make sure the research uh, supports that. At, at present, how many diseases are, uh, are state screening for? There is a, a maximum of about 65 on both the core recommendations and the secondary recommendations, but the core recommendations, which are the ones in which there are individual tests for, there's a, a, about 35 tests that are recommended by the federal government, and then there's another 30 or so that can be detected as part of those primary tests, um, which most some states choose to screen for, some do not. Some have the capacity to screen for, okay. some do not. Um, I wanted to look in, in a, speaking more generally now, uh, NORD's mission obviously is to help patients with rare diseases. Could you talk a little bit about the legislative picture in 2019, now that Democrats control uh, uh, you know, both houses of Congress? Uh, has, has anything significantly shifted? Yeah, I think the one thing that we are really paying attention to at NORD is that the Congress has heard, Democrats and Republicans, has heard loud and clear that people are really concerned about the cost of their health care and the yes. access to their health care. And within that, I think people are really concerned about the cost of therapies and the incentives that go into developing therapies, including orphan drugs and treatments for rare diseases. The, the conference we're at today, the Orphan Drug Congress, is an example of how important therapy access is to the rare disease community. 
So I think one of the things we already know that the House of Representatives is looking at is the cost of medications and all the players in the health system that affect how much drugs cost and how much patients have to pay for them. And so that's something that NORD is, is, is very aware of, and we're developing our, our programs and plans to make sure that we can re best represent the rare disease community in those discussions. At this conference last year, one of the big, hottest topics was the Orphan Drug Act yeah. and the threats uh, to, well, threats by the Senate to either repeal it totally or to significantly reduce it. In the end, the uh, tax benefits were cut by half. Yeah. Correct? Are you satisfied with that, or are you worried that this is still in danger? We always want to make sure that the Orphan Drug Act and the Orphan Drug Tax Credit are continue to be successful. There's no doubt, it is undeniable, that the Orphan Drug Act and the incentives therein have fostered robust development into treatments for rare diseases. Obviously, it's been 35 years since this law was put in place, and there's been amendments along the way that time. So we're always trying to make sure that the law reflects best clinical practice, reflects best evidence, but it is by and large working incredibly well. And so our focus is on making sure that in efforts to potentially reform our entire health system, that we don't throw out the Orphan Drug Act, that we don't make drastic changes to the Orphan Drug Act without understanding how that will specifically affect development and access to care for rare disease patients. Well, now, opponents of the Orphan Drug Act, specifically the tax credit, say that pharmaceutical companies have abused this by creating, you know, similar drugs that are not exactly the same, but you know, in, in order so that there could be loopholes so that these drugs can get tax incentives and, and patent protection, et cetera, exclusivity protection. And I know that NORD has you know, gone to a lot of effort to, to lobby to keep this, to keep the, yeah. the tax credits as they are without any, you know, without any changes. What do you say to those critics who say that the farmers are basically abusing and gaming the system? The, the Reported pharma abuse of the Orphan Drug Act, I think, is emblematic of a lot of myths that are out there about the ODA and about orphan drugs in general. I think one of the big misconceptions about orphan drugs is that they are, this system that we have in place, these incentives that we have in place are abused for the purpose of developing blockbuster drugs and that they take what is supposed to be for a small population and expand it out uh, for a much bigger population. That's just not true. And actually, on Nord's website, you can find a, a document that we produced called Seven Myths of the Orphan Drug. I actually, at our booth over there in the conference center, that document is out there as well. Um, we, we dispel a lot of those myths by, myths by focusing on actually the realities of what these incentives do and do not do. And when you actually look at the data, when you look at the information, you find that a lot of that concern, while there is certainly good reason to think about drug costs in our country, that is not necessarily being driven by the Orphan Drug Act and the abuses um, that people think are existing within the Orphan Drug Act aren't necessarily there. And so I would encourage folks who have questions about that to check out our, our, our information on the myths about the Orphan Drug Act. Now another hot button issue last year, I remember at this time, was the right to try. Yeah. And Nord lobbied very heavily against right to try, even though um, emotional testimony was heard in Congress about patients who had nothing to lose and we're uh, going to die anyway without some miracle. Yeah. Uh, could you talk about that? And do you expect Right to Try to be uh, to come up yet again? I think well, it's it, well, it's not going to come up again right now because it's the law of the land. I mean, Right to Try was passed and enacted. Um, we did oppose it because we felt that it was largely duplicative and unnecessary, given that the FDA Compassionate Use Program has been incredibly successful. Right. Um, but I think we're we, we like many others are waiting to see what happens with Right to Try and see if people are able to to use it in a way that benefits them. That, that remains to be seen, but we don't, and we don't expect it to come up um, based on the conversations I've had this year. Right. But I, I represent state policy, so I can't say for certain what may happen federally. How many, before Right to Try became federal law, how many states, I think it was like 38 or 39 states had already passed laws of their own? Yes, right. there's a good deal of states that have passed their own state Right to Try laws, yeah. So if states at the state level have a law that allows patients to try experimental drugs that have not been approved by the FDA, What's the purpose of a national law? The, as I understand it, the purpose of the national law was that you have to deal with the federal prohibitions on that in addition to the state prohibitions. So I mean, going, you know, states cannot overrule federal law. Um, they cannot overrule the federal government. And right. so while states can eliminate their own barriers to potentially to enact something like right to try, that, would not, that does not address the potential federal barriers that exist. Um, you, uh, you offer a, a you grade state a report card every year on yeah. progress. What states are doing best? What states are doing worst? So I, on the issues that we looked at, which include things like newborn screening, access to medical nutrition, 
um, prescription drug access, uh, rare disease advisory councils, Medicaid benefit design, Medicaid access and Medicaid eligibility, all those issues. We found that a few states like California in particular, Maryland, um, have, are excelling at, at all those issues that we analyzed. Um, they do a good job of expanding their Medicaid program. They do not try to restrict access to benefits for people in the rare disease community. And they've done a good job of making sure that there are protections um, across the board for people with rare disease. Did any state get an A? On, we did not provide an overall grade. So we only provided grades on our individual categories. So you would say Maryland and California are the best performing states? Uh, there are two, they, those are two states that did quite well. Um, Maryland being obviously local to the conference here in right. D.C. There's a lot of other states that did quite well as well on, on different categories. A lot of it, though, I think the majority of states, it's mixed. And you have some states that they have a really great policy when it comes to newborn screening, but they don't have a great policy when it comes to their Medicaid program. Or they don't have a good policy when it comes to medical nutrition or something like that. At the other end of the spectrum, what states did poorly? There are a lot of states out there that have, are falling behind some of the leaders when it comes to rare disease policy. In particular, one issue that we're really concerned about with several states is work requirements in their Medicaid program. So right now, in most states, if you are on Medicaid, you're not required to prove that you have employment in order to receive those Medicaid benefits. But a, a lot of states that we looked at, um, such as Arkansas, uh, Kentucky, and a few others, have either enacted work requirements in their Medicaid program or proposed work requirements in their Medicaid program that would potentially result in thousands of people um, who need access to health care coverage being kicked off of those programs. Because they're not working? Because they are, cannot prove, they're not meeting the requirements of, of the program. So it's not necessarily the case that they're not working. It's just sometimes it's the case that they're not fulfilling the paperwork to prove that they meet that requirement or have an exemption to that work requirement. Is this kind of a subtle way of kicking them off the, 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 the welfare roll, so to speak? Uh, it, it's not welfare, but it, it, it is the... I think if you want to take the take the proponents of work requirements at their word, they believe that this is a way to improve the programs and promote work and ultimately promote health. The evidence out there does not suggest that that, that these programs will accomplish that goal. Um, and what we have seen, the evidence that we do have, shows that when these requirements are implemented in a very um, harmful way, that lots of people are being kicked off Medicaid programs that should be eligible even with the work requirement in place. I understand. Um, so if we could talk about the states that you feel maybe have the most room for improvement, to put it politely, yeah. uh, could you name a few? I, I don't, it's, so, it's there's 50 states that we cover, so it's hard to kind of go through every one. But I, I, in general, the issues that we found where there's a lot of room for improvement across most states are issues like protecting patients from high out-of-pocket drug costs, Issues. Very important issue. Yes. Protecting patients from high out of pocket drug costs. Yes. So that's an issue that not a lot of states have taken action on. Um, there's a lot of states out there that can serve to expand and better support their newborn screening programs so that they can continue to add new diseases as they are recommended by the federal government to their panels. There's a lot of states that have not looked at increasing their Medicaid eligibility or the so called Medicaid expansion. Right. Um, there's still a handful of states that haven't done that yet, which those states were marked down in our report card. Um, and there's a, a new issue for us that we didn't necessarily grade every state on is the creation of rare disease advisory councils. There are seven states currently that have created a rare disease advisory council within oh. their government, but obviously seven have, uh, 54 what haven't. What states are those? Those states are Connecticut, mm -hmm. Pennsylvania, Missouri, Illinois, Alabama, and forgetting one more, and Kentucky. And Alabama. I already mentioned Alabama, sorry. The last two are surprises indeed. Do you cover the district as well? Yes. I mean, we do, we, the district's kind of an interesting dynamic in terms of doing work in that state, but we do have done a little bit of advocacy in D.C. Okay. What about Puerto Rico? We have not done a lot yet in Puerto Rico. We don't have a robust advocacy okay. network down there yet, but um, I believe we have a few patient organizations that work in that state. There is one other issue that I must raise with you, and walking around, you could see a number of um, exhibitors uh, uh, who are promoting uh, cannabis and, and CBD oil, that kind of thing. Now, you have 33 states that have legalized marijuana, yeah. at, including the, and the district, where the federal government obviously has not. Uh, does North take a stand on medical marijuana? Not yet. Um, okay. we, that is an issue we continue to hear from our patient community about, but as of right now, 
marijuana possession is largely still prohibited by the federal government. Right. And it's difficult for a national organization like ours to be doing work in that space um, when the federal government is still believes that that is illegal and should be illegal. Even if it's for medicinal purposes? You're saying the federal government believes that or, or nor well, believe No, I don't think the federal government has a position, but you have a number of states where medical marijuana is still prohibited. Yeah. No, I, it, Do you, is Nord pushing to allow that, we That is right now, it is not an issue that we actively work on. But I can say that many of the advocates that are involved in our reaction network, they're very passionate about that. Um, some of our state ambassadors, uh, prior to becoming Nord volunteers, worked on that issue actively okay. uh, in states prior to joining Nord. It's not something that we have prioritized yet, but we hear about it all the time. And I think also in the context of you know, the, what is called the opioid crisis, Alternative methods of pain management is something that we increasingly have to look at, and I think Nord is really concerned about. Um, but the dynamics at play with the continued federal prohibition of medical right. cannabis kind of creates a challenge for us to kind of navigate there. Well, we haven't the quite. The opioid crisis has been deemed a national emergency by many lawmakers. Yes. So, you know, any way you can get people off opioids seems to be. Th I think a lot, of, a lot of experts would agree with you on that, but there's also within the rare disease community we have found within the opioid crisis that we don't want to overlook people who have intractable pain needs and they need that kind of medication to be able to live normal lives. And so there's, it, like all these issues, there's often a lot of complexity on both sides, but that, that's something we're still trying to kind of weigh through and figure but out and make sure. Could you yeah. also explain for our, our people who are watching uh, what is NORD exactly? It's an umbrella organization that represents patient groups. We represent the rare disease patient community which includes patient organizations. We How have, many are you up to now? We, I believe we have over 270 approaching 300 uh, individual member organizations. Okay, I think that's it. Anything you'd like to add? No, I just, if, uh, if, if, you, if folks out there seeing this haven't yet checked out Nord's website or Nord's Reaction Network, you can go to reaction.org or rarediseases.org to check us out. Thank you so much. Thank you.